I've seen a lot of commentary channels covering a recent video by TikToker Robbie Scott where he discusses his desire to become in a lavender marriage. He believed himself previously to be a gay man, but he wants the trappings of a heterosexual relationship. And a lot of people have been discussing this and making good-natured attempts to connect this to queer history, but not nearly enough people are connecting that to queer modernity because there are a lot of us that, I mean, I until very recently was in relationships with men because it got me more income, it got me more safety, it was less societal pressure, it was less people telling me I'm wrong, I'm bad, I'm dirty, it was less fear, it was less anxiety, and I thought that it was worth it for me. And I know that with regards to Robbie himself, people are like, are you actually gay or are you maybe bisexual? But I want to table that, set that aside for a moment, to discuss the number of people that even to this day are still entering into lavender relationships and the reasons why we do that. Because unfortunately, that's a segment of the LGBTQ population that very often cannot speak for themselves. It's very difficult because unfortunately, the people that are currently in those relationships and are currently doing lavender relationships very often do not want to discuss it in any public form or fashion. A lot of times we view things like Lance Bass going on a date with Danielle Fischel to prom as like bearding that happened among celebrities in the past and completely ignore the fact that there are probably any number of celebrities that are still in beard relationships because there is still significant societal pressures against it. Like, look at all of the pressure that Billie Eilish has faced in coming out. It has caused her to step back into the closet. It has caused her to react away from our community and react away from embracing herself publicly as a queer individual. And as someone who now very much realizes what my life was lacking because I was not an out queer person earlier in my life, I... <sighs> I feel like I have to discuss these things, right? Because on the one hand, there are people that are going to be in situations where a lavender marriage is their best possibility. And I have to admit that, especially for people that are most financially disenfranchised, a lavender marriage is often the best way for them to get out of that situation into a situation that they have a little bit more freedom to be themselves or a little bit more financial freedom. At least. And I think it's definitely especially tempting for women because if we're not in a relationship Relationship, it is seen as more defective than a single man not being in a relationship. But also you've got like the wage gap, you've got the pink tax, you've got all of these safety concerns, which I mean, having a man in your house isn't always the safest thing, but women are taught that having a man around is safer than not having a man around. But then when you also factor in things like the added expense that a lot of queer couples have when they're trying to have a kid, there are a lot of people who are like, maybe it's not worth it. Maybe it's not worth all of the pressure that I have to go through to be who I truly am. And I think this is especially prominent amongst people that are bi, right? Because from the time I was like 25, I thought I was like a 90-10 bisexual. I thought I was 90% attracted to women, and I really tried to stretch that 10% to encompass me being in long-term sustained relationships with men. Even though I had examined myself very early in my life and realized that I like myself more when I'm not in a relationship. And I could never really figure out why that was until I finally came out of the closet and realized how much of myself I had to sacrifice. Like, there are a lot of things, and this is going to sound so insignificant to people that haven't done it, but there were, like, clothes that I wanted to wear, songs that I wanted to listen to, events that I wanted to go to. Like, even when I was out as bi, I was trying to be out as bi in a way that was, like, attractive to men. Like, I wanted men to be like, oh, this is a girl who might have sex with girls in front of me. Like, I wanted that response because that was likely to get me into a relationship where, at least in part, I was able to still humor women. But I couldn't go so far. I couldn't embrace my queerness to the point where it was, like, male repulsive, right? Like, I couldn't be a D-word lesbian, if you catch my drift. And I guarantee you that there are a number of celebrities that are in lavender marriages and lavender relationships even nowadays, right? Because we think back on things like Lance Bass and Daniel Fischel going to prom together and like that kind of bearding era and there are other gay celebrities that in the past have admitted to being in heterosexual relationships to conceal their gayness but obviously both on the celebrity level and on the normal people level the large majority of people who are in a lavender marriage have to conceal the fact that they're in a lavender marriage so unless you are also really like in those spaces in the spaces where people in lavender relationships like tend to congregate 
you're probably not going to think that it's super common anymore. But I guarantee you, within the next couple of years, there will be more prominent celebrities coming out as queer, and we will look back at their previous relationships and be like, well, wait a minute, did you, did, weren't, you in a, weren't you in a relationship with that one person at one time? And now I do admit that nowadays it's less lavender marriage and more often lavender long-term cohabitation or long-term long-distance relationship. A lot of times it's a less serious commitment, but it is still a commitment that is designed to conceal the queerness of one or both parties. And I think also because more and more people are recognizing themselves as bi and pan or ethically non-monogamous, but they're still wanting to put on like a front of monogamy. So you've got this like growing ranks of people who, yes, they are in a publicly facing hetero appearing relationship, but one or both of those parties is allowed to dally in deviate in the side, you know? And I think that is far more common than people realize. As somebody who used to be poly, like when you go into those spaces, you will realize, especially because I, by the time I was poly, I was less shameful about things like not being straight. As I said, I was at least out as bi at this point and like being a swinger or being poly or like dating a man but having girls on the side was a little bit more socially acceptable than it had been like earlier in my dating career. And when I started started to tell people, oh yeah, you know, we're poly, we each have a partner on the side, things like that, more and more and more people kept coming out to me and saying, oh yeah, I'm secretly, <laughs> I secretly like girls too, and my husband lets me have a girlfriend on the side, we just don't tell anybody. And there's a lot of reasons to do this. Like, for example, there are a good number of employers where in order to add somebody onto your health plan, if you're not like legally married, you have to say, oh, we're monogamous and we're a long-term serious relationship and we're not seeing any other parties on the side and we haven't been for six months. And that was something that actually a previous place that I worked had in their stipulations. So one of my coworkers admitted to me, yeah, I'm poly, but I can't admit to that because if the company finds out that I'm poly, my, my, wife, which they weren't legally married, but they considered each other married, my wife will lose her health insurance. There are a number of situations like that where people are pretending to be in a heterosexual marriage and then on the side they have all sorts of other things going on. And I tend to see those people in scenarios as being orphaned members of the queer community, right? Because they are not able to fully be in communion with our community at all times the way a lot of us now can be. Like there are a good number of us that are embracing our freedom to marriage and things like that that we now have. But I think especially since 20 2016, when you have this turning of tides, when you have a small but very powerful portion of the population that is hammering in that queer people are bad and evil and are going to go to hell and all of these things, there is a lot of motivation to try and conceal that part of yourself. And like I said, a lot of the people that are discussing this and just queerness as a whole, relationships as a whole, celebrity relationships as a whole, things like that, people do not realize the number of people who are just in a hetero passing relationship on the surface because it makes their life easy in a number of ways. It is very common for people in the ace community especially to conceal the fact that they're asexual and be in a relationship with somebody that they front as it being a sexual relationship because weirdly we act as though people are defective if they don't want the hanky panky time. I okay and i think especially if you have not experienced like being in a hetero passing relationship versus having people perceive you as queer and like the ways that that makes your life more difficult the ways that people treat you differently i know like when i came out as a lesbian i realized just how many of my guy friends had just been hanging around hoping that some point i would be desperate enough to sleep with one of them and that's not even to mention the number of lgbtq people whose own partners do not know that they are queer and that was me for a long period of time like pretty much from the time that I was 25 on my partner may have thought that I was a little bi none of my partners knew I was a lesbian and not even all of my partners knew that I was a little bi there were absolutely partners that I dated that I understood that that facet of myself was not going to be accepted and I accepted it because I thought that was what I had to accept. That's what society basically told me that I had to accept because society had painted women that liked women as being so undesirable. It never really occurred to me 
that it's very desirable to other women, especially other women-loving women. Like, so much of what society tells us we have to do, especially as women, is you have to be an object for a man to use or for multiple men to use in multiple different ways. And when you take yourself out of that, when you de-objectify yourself, they realize you are taking away power. Because of that, making the decisions to live publicly as yourself, to publicly say, I am a queer person, and to embrace it in all aspects of your life is very difficult for a lot of people. And especially because it's not just coming out once. I mean, I don't, a lot of lesbians think that I look like lesbian. Sure, the large majority of men do not think they're gay upon first meeting me. It is a process of educating people constantly, day after day after day. Sorry, I'm not into you like that. That's not my thing. And that's not even counting the number of people who are lying to themselves about their orientation and are still in lavender relationships not realizing it. Um, and I think that's something that happens more frequently than not because a number of like late in life lesbians, the people that they married are late in life gay men. And it's very common for like one partner in a marriage to come out and the other part in the marriage to be like, oh yeah, um, me too. I realized that later down the fact, like once <laughs> we had been married for some years, but I didn't really know how to tell you. Like, I thought I was straight until I was 25. And like I said, at 25, I realized I was bi, but I still tried to lie to myself about how much I was attracted to women. And a lot of times I was able to pretend like I was happy with a man until I got like the desired circumstance, right? Until we were like happily together and living together and I was still miserable. And I was like, why am I so miserable? I have everything that I've always wanted. Oh, because I've been been lying to myself ever since I was a child about what I actually wanted because I was told in church that being gay was bad. And then there's also the matter of procreation, right? Things like IVF are extraordinarily expensive. Even just like getting sperm, if you're a lesbian, to take it home and turkey baster it yourself can be an expense if you don't know somebody who's personally that's, that's safe and accommodating to do that with. And that's not to mention all of the like side effects and all of the other things that go into that that doesn't necessarily come up when you're having babies the PIV way if you catch my drift. So there are a number of people, I mean it's not super uncommon for like lower income LGBTQ couples to have like a gay couple and a lesbian couple make babies together and then that kid has four parents or those kids have four parents. And I do think that we're probably going to see kids with more than two parents becoming more and more common as people become more accepting of things like polyamory and also just this idea of like blending and mixing families and things like that. A lot of people end up in multiple relationships over the course of their life. And I think that's one of the worst things about marriage to me is this perception that marriage should be to death to us part. Relationships really should be until this relationship is no longer giving both of us benefit. If one of us is suffering all the time or if both of us is suffering all the time, if there is no longer benefit for one or both parties, and you've worked to try and bring it back to a situation where you're congruent. And then there's just sometimes when things happen and you don't confront them the same ways and that takes you in different directions, right? Like if you have one partner that is set on having a biological child and you have the other partner who is infertile, their needs are not necessarily going to agree in the ways that they might want them to agree. And it may just be something like somebody gets a job opportunity in one state and the other person doesn't want to go and making the decision, hey, like we need to put ourselves ahead of this relationship because I'm the only person that I'm going to have for my whole life. And I think as more and more people realize that they're the only person that they're going to have for their whole life, people are going to see marriage as something that is more of a short-term thing. I'm actually kind of shocked that we don't have like tenure marriage or like part-term marriage or something along those lines for couples that know that they want to be together for a period of time and want to have the benefits of marriage but who don't necessarily want to have the drawbacks of divorce if they decide in 10 years that they're two totally different people. As people are living longer, there's a greater chance that people are going to have things that make them disagree, especially when you have people, like I said, getting married so young before they really know who they are and all of that jazz. 
Something that I didn't explicitly mention, but I feel like I should, is the fact that like just because you're in a lavender marriage doesn't necessarily mean that has to be a loveless union. A lot of people in lavender relationships do have elements and types of love for one another. And it may be romantic, just it may not extend to the bedroom. So it's not necessarily an arrangement that is going to be devoid of love. This is still somebody that you are trusting with one of the deepest secrets that you have and you are spending a significant portion of your life with and if you want to do it healthfully long term I think it actually is key to try and find some sort of like some sort of love and then there's an entirely different deeper level that I think even a lot of like queer people don't consider and I want to dive into something that a lot of people call relationship anarchy which is basically like we're not going to follow the assigned definitions for what a friendship is is, what a marriage is, what a long-term commitment is, things like that. We're not necessarily going to assume that the person we marry is also the person that we're in love with. Sometimes we marry somebody for that stability of that relationship because we know that we want to like sleep with multiple people. We know that the romantic aspect of ourself tends to be a little bit more flighty. We don't want that instability to affect our home or our child rearing. And I think this is especially common amongst people that are richer. Like you have a lot of rich people who get married and the idea is we maintain a house together and we have children that we rear together because those two things we need to be lockstep on one another about what decisions we're making or else it can get very very hairy but in terms of like who we're going to sleep with who we're going to romance those things are a lot more flighty they're a lot less predictable i don't want them interfering with my house and my child so i'm going to do those things with other people and relationship anarchy isn't always defined the same way like a lot of times it is just the people that are in these relationships are defining what these relationships look like like for me personally, I don't consider myself monogamous or poly. I consider myself as having a list of specific needs that I have that need to get met. And I meet them a variety of ways, right? Some of those needs are being met through romantic relationships. Some of those needs are being met through friendships. Some of those needs are being met by myself personally. Some of those needs get met by family. Like, like we get to decide how those needs get met with the people that we have available to us in our lives. Like me personally, at present, I am self-partnered. I have have these list of needs that I need to have met and I have decided that I will be the one who meets them. The big difference than that is that like I cohabitate with my family instead of a romantic partner because that's a more stable situation for me and it's a safer situation that prevents me from getting in harm. Another thing is is people that are neurodivergent like me. Like a lot of times people that are trying to romance me, people that are trying to get me into a long-term commitment are people that are kind of controlling, kind of manipulative, and having my long-term living with my family, it gives me that added perspective on the people that I'm dating and whether or not they feel it's a healthy relationship as well. And especially with a lot of late in life queer people, you may already have children with a person of the opposite gender that you were married to initially, and you may decide to continue to cohabitate with them, continue to raise those children together so that those children can have a stable household because that is what the two of you value the most. And then you make rules about whether other people on the side are allowed to live in the home or if they live separately or how those other relationships on the side are handled such that your children aren't suffering the consequences of relationships that aren't as stable. And I think especially when you're first coming out of the closet later in life and you don't have any experience, you are literally starting a new type of dating later in life. And I know a lot of later in life lesbians that have entered into relationships with female narcissists because they hadn't necessarily healed themselves between going Going from point A to point B. And when point A is cis heteronormativity, very few people, especially almost no queer people, get out of cis heteronormativity in those types of relationships unscathed. Like being told that you are defective because you like somebody of the same gender or that you identify with a different gender than the one that you were born, those things can be very traumatic. It's v especially when you're going through it for years and years on end and the people that are telling you these things are people that you have been taught to trust ever since you were a child. So many more people realize that they are gay later in life than most people are willing to admit and I think one of the big reasons a lot of people aren't willing to admit that is because they're not willing
willing to just sit around with themselves and look at their own like gender identity and what they're attracted to and who they want and things like that because they're going to realize things about themselves that they're not comfortable with because they haven't like addressed all of the bigotry that's been programmed into them by societal programming. So I guess basically overall what I'm saying is is that for some people especially if you're newly escaping from some sort of very high control religious structure it can be safer to get into a lavender relationship with somebody and get to find yourself and get to be comfortable in yourself and get to get a little bit more financial stability and get to be able to support yourself on your own before you continue on to a relationship that is something that is more validating for your queerness. I think there are more gay men and lesbians out there who do not have the financial means to leave their repressive family structures and religious structures on their own until after such point when they get married to somebody. And I think one of the points that I want this discussion to include is like, you're not crazy for wanting a lavender marriage. You're not even regretting for wanting a lavender marriage. I do think that you should know that you're probably not going to have all of your needs met in that marriage, especially if you're not open to your partner. If you're not open to your partner, if you're not able to have the queer relationships that you desire on the side, there is probably going to be an element a hole inside you. One of the big things with me realizing that I wasn't actually bi, that I was actually a lesbian, is I really sat down and I considered, have I ever met a man that could or would meet my needs? And the answer was a flat no. And that was the point when I really had to confront the fact that I was a lesbian. But it took 38 years for me to really get to that point where I hammered that nail in, right? There are absolutely going to be scenarios where a lavender relationship is safer and easier than a hetero relationship, especially if you were someone who is like really stuck in some really rural town where there's not that much, right? And I think a lot about starter marriages or the fact that a lot of people end up in one marriage that fails before they marry like the right person for them because we put a lot of pressure on people who are very young and who do not know themselves very well yet to get married and pump out babies as soon as possible. And what I don't want people to do and what I especially want women to understand is that if a controlling man like gets you pregnant, he's going to have some access over you and your life for until that kid is an adult. It is truly haunting the number of lesbians that I see come out of the closet when their kids hit 18 because they know if they did it sooner that their husband would do everything in his power to make their life hard. Like many other things in life, lavender marriage has both pros and cons. And I know people who have gone through it and it has worked out really well for them because their partner was as well. Like I've been saying this whole video, both lavender marriages and polyamory as a whole are more common than most people would realize and I really hate the fact that they are like taboo topics that we can't really talk about that much and my hope is that in talking about it at least a little bit in this video that a I might reach some people that are considering entering into a lavender relationship and who wanted to know the respective pros and cons wanted to know feelings from somebody who had actually been in those type of relationships before and there were absolutely things that worked out well for me it's just my primary reason for doing it was to save my parents trouble, to be quite frank. There are a number of people in my extended family that are very homophobic, and my belief was basically, I will make more money if I'm not a lesbian because I was in IT. I was already at a disadvantage financially by being a woman. Being a lesbian was going to be an extra, like, less money that I get. I realized that. Um, I also worried about my overall physical safety because I'm a tiny little thing. I'm clumsy. I, I'm oblivious to most things. And I went into these relationships seeking safety. And sometimes, yes, I did get safety. I did get affirmation. I did, I was allowed to go off and be with a girl on my time and be with a guy on a relationship time. But I was also in a number of situations where I thought I was in this relationship because it was safer, but the person who I had chosen for that relationship was not actually a safe person for me. And I definitely think when you're not doing it for the right reasons, it can be hard harder to identify figures who are trying to take advantage of you. And in my mind, especially when the person that I was with was not aware that I was queer, I felt like I had this blemish, this tarnishing that made me less valuable. So that made me accept less from men in those relationships as well. 
I do truly hope that we soon get beyond the point where people need to pretend that they're married and straight and things like that just to be able to like get ahead in society, especially in more conservative careers and especially in more male driven careers. You often have this phenomenon where like the, the men that are married are the ones that move up because they're seen as more responsible. They're going to work harder because they don't want to lose their family's income. There are any number of notions that are unrelated to queerness that cause people to enter into marriage before they want it or when they don't want it. And realistically, until we have things like universal basic income, until we have a safety net so queer people who don't have their family support and who do not have a lot of financial means do not have to pursue these relationships. Hi, if you like this video, I talk about pop culture and pop music from the perspective of a late in life lesbian. I talk a lot about Taylor Swift and other pop starlets, things along that lines. I also talk about my life as a queer person. I am still a very small channel, so your likes, comments, and subscriptions do help me out a tremendous amount. Have a wonderful day.